August 23rd meeting of the Oak Park Board of Education. Ms. Greer, can you please call the roll? Here. Smith. Here. And who didn't like it? Good friend. I said here. Ms. Lungan. Calvin. Here. Yes, I'm here. And we are meeting in person at the Oak Park High School Auditorium to be in compliance with the Open Meetings Act. Ms. Lunkins, Trustee Lunkins is joining us remotely due to a medical condition. Trustee Lunkins, can you state the city and state where you're located, please? I'm at 13971 Kenwood, Oak Park, Michigan. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. And we are gonna move ahead on um, this today. We, we have some lighting issues here on the stage. So we're gonna go ahead and skip the recitation of the district's mission and vision and belief statements. But I do wanna share with the community and the board, um, this is our first meeting of the new school year. And I had the opportunity this morning to join the, um, the celebration from here in this room and simulcast to all the buildings. And particularly excited this year, looking at the five areas of our strategic plan and the new things that we're starting this new year with. So when we think about learning environment and culture, the early childhood center that's being developed at Lessinger School and how that's going to provide such a wonderful learning environment for our young students. Bye. Um, when we think about personnel, bye. starting the year with a bye. new with a new contract so bye, that bye. our teachers this year have seen a, an average of a 7% increase. Um, we, we have longevity bonuses to, um, to encourage those teachers who have been here for a long time to stay. Our teachers are now at the, some of the highest paid teachers in the area. So we're excited about that. We're excited about our operations improvements, which um, where we have so many new things for our students, uh, for our students to enjoy when they come back into the buildings next week and they see the new, the new media centers and the new cafeteria here in the high school and the new, um, the new playgrounds in our elementary schools. When we think about academics and programs, some of the great learning plans and programs that have been put in place as we go forward by um, Ms. Baptiste and her team. And of course, when it comes to communications and community engagement, some of the new co communications tools that have been rolled out. So we're excited about those things, moving forward with our strategic plan in a new school year as we had um, to even greater things in the 2021-2022 school year. And we do have an agenda in front of us. I'd like to ask if any board members have any questions about the agenda in order of business. Trustee Goodfriend. Yes, on the um, personnel action, I'd like that set aside out of the consent agenda because I have some questions. Okay, thank, thank you. you, and we'll, we'll get to that when we get to the consent agenda. Are there any questions about the agenda itself? Seeing none, I'll ask for unanimous consent to approve the agenda in order of business. Support. Seeing no objection, the agenda in order of business is approved, and we move on to our consent agenda. Trustee Goodfriend has asked for the personnel actions to be removed, so the only other item is our approval of minutes. Does any board member object to having that on our, having the approval of minutes on the consent agenda? Okay, then I will ask for a voice vote. All in favor of approval of the minutes, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. The, the minutes are approved and we'll move personnel actions down to action items. We move now to presentations and we're joined today by Mr. Stephen Melkor, the Director of Technology at Oakland Schools. 
who's going to speak to us about some of the changes in technology with the Oakland Schools contract. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Stephen Melchor. I'm a director of technology with Oakland Schools. I want to thank you all very much for having me tonight. It's a pleasure to meet all of you. I uh, just wanted to give you a brief overview of some of the changes that we are, we are going to see this school year as it revolves around technology. Can you hear me? She can't hear, can't hear, can't hear Steve, do you want to take your oh, uh, so, mask okay. off just yes, for the please. purpose of the presentation? Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Oakland Schools is very excited to have partnered with Oak Park um, in our field services technology department. What we're able to provide Oak Park is a robust team of technology professionals. We have on site every day our technology coordinator, Jim, who I'm sure you all know very well. Um, Jim has a right hand man who is our senior technology support specialist. He's basically the lead of our day to day on the ground support team. He is joined by three technical assistants that will be our real our boots on the ground um, support team on a daily basis. These are staff members that you will get used to seeing in the buildings, uh, the principals, the teachers will all get to know the support staff as they are in the buildings on a daily basis. Our, our tech support staff will be assigned to specific buildings. That way people get used to seeing familiar faces um, every day when we're helping support technology. We also have the pleasure of having an in-house network administrator. Our network administrator basically does all of the behind the scenes networking and infrastructure. He helps us in our, um, our rollout of larger technology initiatives, email upgrades, phone system upgrades, things like that. And we're also great, um, thankful to have, we'll be onboarding shortly, a technology integration specialist. The technology integration specialist is a key member of our team. Um, that is a person that is, specializes in technology in the classroom. Um, that person will work with your staff on professional development, about using new technology in the classroom. As we've been spending all summer rolling out the model classroom to each building, Promethean boards, docking stations, laptops, that person will be able to assist teachers, making sure that they're utilizing the technology properly in the classroom moving forward. So we're very excited. In addition to that, as a field service district, you have access to our entire technology team. We have almost 200 people in our technology department at Oakland Schools. A lot of big brains on our, our team. Um, we're able to bring a lot to the table as far as knowledge, as far as experience. Um, we have our wonderful support, our support service desk. They are the first line of, they're the first line of support for the, the staff of Oakland, of Oak Park. We have four different ways that staff can reach out to our service desk. They can email, they can call, they can go to our online ticketing system. And we even have a live chat feature now. So if a teacher is in a position where they just need really quick help, they can log into our live chat and, and, get, and get support that way. The value of being with the Oakland Schools Field Services Department is we're able to roll out a lot of large projects and get the best pricing possible. One example of that is we'll be implementing this school year a new phone system. Um, Oakland Schools was able to partner with a neighboring ISD to go out for bid for phone systems. Um, so we have the best pricing available on phones and infrastructure. Um, the, also the benefit is, is this is the same centralized phone system that we've rolled out across the county. Uh, I've worked in previously West Bloomfield and Southfield districts and all these districts are using the same back end system. So, we're rolling out new technology to Oak Park, but it's not new to us. We've done this before. So you, you guys are getting the value of the added experience that we have as a, as a collective county and the rest of our field service districts. Another benefit is centralized platforms. Um, one of the biggest things that we've done in the last year to year and a half in Oakland schools is roll out a centralized technology inventory platform. When the pandemic hit, we all realized very quickly that inventory and keeping track of our assets and keeping track of our student devices, whether it's in the district or at home, it is very important. So we have a very robust platform that integrates with our service desk system. 
So that way we know what students have what devices, how many devices we have, and that way we can plan better for the future. Mobile device management, managing all these Chromebooks, managing iPads, things like that. These are all systems that are centrally located at Oakland schools. We've been building out these systems, like I said, over the last year, year and a half, and it'll just help all of us better manage our devices. Now, devices has been quite the topic over the last year and a half. Um, one of the main things that our team's been working on just this summer is making sure that we've got a Chromebook cart for every classroom in the district, um, prepping devices for new students, prepping devices to replace broken or end of life devices. Um, and that's taken a lot of time of our team, just physical work, getting these devices unboxed, getting the carts wired, getting them put in the carts and getting those deployed across the, across the district. So we're, we're very excited. We have a lot of devices um, in district as well as to be sent home. So we're very excited about that. One of our, um, one of our we have a list of priority projects that we wanna tackle this school year and we're excited about. One, I mentioned the phone system. Most of our classrooms already have new phones in each classroom. So we'll be focusing on rolling out new phones to our administrative team and our, our building principals, as well as the back end infrastructure. We're also work, work, I've been having some very, very good conversations with Dr. Hitchcock. We're gonna be partnering with uh, the city of Oak Park to provide some after school activities, esports group, uh, esports program where kids can have a place to go after school and, and play video games, play esports. So we're excited to get that project rolled out. Um, and then continued professional development. That's one of our main focuses is not only just putting these new classrooms together with new technology, empowering the teachers to use the technology properly, to be able to utilize it best that it's benefiting them and it's benefiting our students. Um, that's one of our, our main focuses always is is making sure that the teachers have the have the tools that they need to succeed when it comes to technology. Um, one of the things that we're excited about doing is we're going to start to take a, a proactive approach um, for our students and their devices that they're using at home. We are going to create a, a asynchronous, if you will, sort of a lesson plan that will kind of help our students learn best practices about device care and how to take care of your device so that we don't have, so that we can improve our breakage rate amongst student devices. We are coming up with a plan where we are going to provide multiple free repairs for students that do break their device. It happens. I broke my laptop screen about six months ago. It's just, it's one of the things that happens, but the more knowledge that we can give students about device care, and how to take care of those devices at home, bringing them to and from you know, school, um, we're gonna come up with a plan to, to get, the, get the students the knowledge they need to better take care of their devices. We're also coming up with a program where if we, have, um, if we have students that are constantly breaking their devices and we're seeing you know, heavy turnover, we're gonna offer a program where the students and the parents can come in and take a class in person to where we go ahead and we show them as a family you know, best practice for, for taking care of your devices and, and how to make sure that, that that device becomes a tool that they, that they care about and that they're treating you know, with respect on a daily basis. So we're excited to be putting that, that together for this school year. We figure it makes sense to you know, get the students some training proactively, but as well as be prepared reactively with, with additional resources for the families and their devices. So we are very excited to get the school year underway. Um, I think we're gonna start seeing a lot of changes, a lot of, um, a lot of new things, one of the things that I've, I've been in the district the last two months, I've noticed a lot, of, a lot of improvement for spaces. We have technology that has kind of grown roots in some areas, so we're going to be working on cleaning that up. We're going to be cleaning up our inventory. We're going to make useful spaces out of the technology areas that we have available to us. And again, that in turn ties in with our inventory. You know, what assets do we have that is old technology, and how are we keeping track of our new technology? So that's what I had for you this evening. Um, I'll open it if anybody has any questions. All right, um, we'll start with Trustee Smith. 
and then Trustee Goodfriend, Corcoran, and Elder. Okay. Mr. Elder, thank you for that presentation and um, addressing some of the information that some of us may have had towards uh, Al, can you speak with your microphone, please? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for addressing some, some of those points uh, in regards to this transition that we're into now. Um, you know, I think every school district probably has experienced the same where we're now in a combined joint effort, you know, regards to our technical, our technical capabilities. And um, before, prior to that, you know, we were so used and comfortable with having our own teams. What I want to find out here, those th in regards, because the fact that, you know, we have a multitude of platforms that we that we're now opened up, you know, we, the, the school districts are now um, open, open up to, um, is there any like, certification for those, for those staff, those personnel, you know, uh, are we are we doing any training and 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 you know certifications for those those staff members? You know, like in, in, in a sense, of trying to create you know uh, a, a open pathway for their careers. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, that's so that would be um, that would be something that our technology integration specialists would work closely with the staff. Um, I know that we're uh, you know that we utilize you know Google products and things like that, and that's definitely something that that integration specialist can bring to the, those groups of teachers who are interested in, in, you know, taking an extra step and, you know, taking that, that what, what don't I know, what do I want to learn? So yeah, we have those opportunities available and that integration specialist is going to work very closely. And I'm, re, and I'm referring to those technicians that may have now, they're now over into the centralized, mm -hmm. you know, centralized sort of, you know, like, you know, we, we have techs, you know, that were right here just specifically mm -hmm. to Oak Park school districts. So are we giving them the ability to grow in their careers? In their yeah, absolutely. And that's one thing that it's one thing that um, I've seen. I've been with Oakland schools for the last nine years since the inception of our field services, um, our field services model. And one of the things that I'm, I, I'm a product, I started nine years ago as a computer tech myself. We empower our staff and we promote from within all the time. Um, uh, the technology, the technology assistants that we have on our team now, they're young, they're, they're early on in their career, and we encourage that. When we're hiring technical assistants, we require you to have a drive for technology, and we will teach you the tools. So we love empowering our own staff. Um, they get act, the, One of the greatest things about our technicians and working in this environment is they get access to so much different technology, right? So that ends up sparking interest in, okay, I've got a tech that's green, but he wants to go into networking, or I have a tech that's a real good people person, he wants to go into management, he wants to go into coordination like what Jim does. So it's very exciting. We promote work from within all the time. It's almost a blessing and a curse because sometimes we're just, we have a constant flow of people moving up right. and just backfilling. So yeah, absolutely. Okay, good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Trustee, good friend. Uh, Thank you for your presentation. I appreciate what you, you're uh, outlining for us. When you say devices, uh, helping young people or the families to be able to care for their devices, could you be a little more explicit or what are the devices? Are we sure, talking? yeah. So Chromebooks, that Chromebook is our tool that we use in district. Uh, the Chromebooks are in the classrooms and that's the same platform of the devices that students have at home. So they're not using something at home that they're not used to using in the classroom. Um, you know, some districts struggled when the pandemic hit as they didn't have enough devices. So then we had students doing, you know, writing research papers on a cell phone. And that just, for us, it just doesn't make sense to have them using these multitude of platforms and a cell phone. You can't write a research paper on, on a cell phone. So that's why it's really great that Oak Park had the ability to provide students with a device at home and devices in every classroom. And, and thank you. I appreciate when you, you clarify that for me. The other portion of it is when there is a device, a Chromebook, that uh, the family can't uh, manipulate or fix itself. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, does that go to your department? Yes. So I know that sounds like that had been a struggle in the past. Um, as the technology department, we feel as if though device exchanges, device repair, that falls under our umbrella. So we're going to be taking ownership of that. We are going to be creating what we're calling office hours. Uh, it's going to be an hour before school starts, an hour after school starts, and then an hour before school gets out. 
and an hour after school gets out, a couple days a week so that we can have parents come with, with a device that may not be working or maybe they just need a quick, simple help with something that's not working at home, that maybe it's working elsewhere. So we are, we are more than happy to take ownership of that. Um, and that again, it ties into these initiatives like mobile device management and asset management and our inventory so that we have an accurate, you know, an accurate scope of who has what, you know, how many repairs that are required. Um, if they have a device that maybe it's just the device's fault, not everything wrong with the computer is necessarily the user's fault sometimes. So we'll be able to assess that in person and make sure that they have a device um, in school and at home. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for all your help with us. More than welcome. I just lost. Trustee Corporate. Yes, um, Mr. Steve, thanks a lot for all of the information, half of the things that you did cover of the majority of my questions, but there is one question that I did have, um, well, actually two. In regards to the replacement, um, is there gonna be a charge for those um, laptops that are? So we're still kind of in the process of putting together an official, an official process. The idea is, is that we know accidents happen. So the idea is that we're gonna provide students with a certain amount of free repairs, whether it's a cracked screen, a broken keyboard, you know, maybe they broke off the, uh, the charger in the charging port. So we're, we're gonna offer two free repairs. After that, we are going to have a price list that basically outlines repair costs. So for instance, if a student cracks their third screen, we'll be able to offer them to be able to pay for that repair. If you can't afford that repair, then come in and take this class that we're gonna offer. We're gonna have this class where a parent can bring a student in in the evening and they'll sit down and we'll go over best practice for device care like I had mentioned. And then at that point, that serves as your repair cost and, we'll be, and you'll be issued a new device. So that's tentatively our plan. We're still kind of figuring out some of the details, logistics around that. Um, but that's kind, of the, that's kind of our idea is to create that content so that they can, you know, we, we're kind of empowering our parents and our families to, you know, take, take ownership over these devices that the district's provided them. Absolutely. And the last question that I had is in regards to like any type of um, security as far as like the firewalls, seeing that we have now um, more students and, you know, and we have some home and in school. Um, so what type of uh, security system? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think that was on my agenda and I think I missed it. Um, cybersecurity has been at the focal point of what Oakland schools has been doing. I mean, you get, we hear about it every day. I actually had, I got, I actually got a call from a, uh, uh, my bank the other day that my you know my credit card got hacked so something that we're living with every single day another benefit of being under the Oakland schools umbrella is every single one of our devices will be enrolled in the device management google management what's nice about that is that we can push out like web filters that cover these devices so that students are well better protected in school or at home so this is it's a it's a global and you know, we don't like to get into too many details about security and settings like this, just because you know, we try to keep it as you know, um, behind lock and key as we can, but we are taking steps across the board to make sure that our students are safe online. Thank you. All right, do any other board members have questions? All right, I, I have one question, Mr. Mel uh, Mr. Melkor. Um, we, a few years ago, the district invested in setting up our, um, our, our servers with backup um, to, to make sure that our servers didn't go down in a, in a blackout. We wanted to, we, we set up um, a generator for both, I believe, our web servers and for our um, phone servers with this transferring over to Oakland schools, does that get affected at all? Is that, are those servers still being housed in Oak Park or does that- So everything, yeah, you? everything as far as hardware and servers and backups is gonna be falling under the Oakland schools umbrella. So we take regular backups. Um, you know, we have an entire network team that's dedicated to those sort of, those sort of measures. 
Um, our, the website, I believe, is hosted from a third party, so that's something that's backed up on their end. But as far as servers and phone system and all that, that all falls under the Oakland Schools network security umbrella. So then there wouldn't be any need anymore for that generator on site for, for that, am I understanding? For that, that purpose, correct. Okay. So that so then one thing that we, okay, and that gives us an, a mean, resource to look at for other, for other considerations. If we have this generator that we no longer need for that purpose, we should discuss what else we can use that for. We would still use, we would still need the generator. Of course. Yeah. It's talking about we, power purposes. For power purposes, yes. right, absolutely, right. Yeah. We still, yeah, we still but do that. we still need power going to our on-site servers if the if they're if it's being hosted at open yeah. schools? He's still connecting. He's still going to be okay. connecting to those. Yeah. We All still right. need that UPS. So we that's why I asked the question. I, I don't understand Absolutely. that stuff as well. Thank you. Yes. All right. Thank you, Miss. Um, thank you. Anything else from the board? Exactly. All right. Thank you, Mr. Melkor. Thank, thank you very you. much. I appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Malcolm. We move now to a presentation from Dr. Hitchcock and Ms. Baptiste. Good evening. Um, I would first like to start out sharing a few protocols um, that will be important as we transition into this school year. And then Ms. Baptiste will share all of the details about our learning model for this upcoming school year. Please keep in mind that um, some of these things are reminders because uh, we have shared this information with the board previously, but we're asked to do so again as um, you know, we're, we're quickly approaching the start of the upcoming school year. So first I would like to share um, that we are very proud to say that we have instituted a universal mask mandate for all students and staff, which is in accordance with the CDC, MDHHS, and Oakland County Health Department. We definitely understand that that is one of the key layers to keeping uh, our students and staff safe. Uh, our mask mandate will extend to our school buses. We will also, um, lower the windows on school buses and uh, have masks available to ensure our students' safety as they ride the bus to and from school. Um, we have a required physical distancing with a minimum of three feet. Um, and this, this at times can be confusing to uh, some folks because some of our classrooms are smaller. Um, but what we know is that there are a number of items in our rooms that we may have to remove and some teachers may have to teach in a different or alternate classroom if they have more students than what the three feet will allow. Um, but our goal is to maintain three feet um, in instructional areas and um, outside of our instructional areas to have a minimum of three feet. So um, students have a decent amount of social distancing between them. Uh, but with our mask mandate, we are hopeful that that will help keep everyone safe and wanna reiterate that that is also consistent with the guidance from public health officials. We will also um, continue our daily screening through our Clear to Go app, which we're very proud of to provide convenience to stakeholders in our community to make sure that, that folks give themselves pause prior to coming into the building, really being thoughtful about whether or not they have any symptoms or um, they're exhibiting anything that they may not have originally considered. It's just one more opportunity to be really thoughtful of that before walking into our buildings. We have had a number of childhood immunization fairs and COVID-19 vaccination fairs. We're extremely proud of our partnerships in the community. And this is just another opportunity to highlight uh, one of our district nurses, Vanessa Long, for her leadership in this effort to ensure that our students receive their 
regular childhood immunizations, as well as making the COVID-19 vac COVID vaccine available to students who are 12 years and older. Um, we also have uh, worked hard to provide ventilation and uh, air purifiers in all of our uh, instructional spaces. So there are large air, purifier, air purifiers and smaller ones um, in our classrooms and larger instructional areas throughout the building. Um, we are encouraging our students and staff to go outside whenever possible. I was thrilled this afternoon to see uh, a group of teachers at one of our elementary schools. They were meeting outside just to do everything possible to keep people safe. And while this weather is nice, it, it's nice to be able to take students and staff outside. Um, we're encouraging staff to uh, maintain seating charts in consistent seating um, schedules. And why are we doing this? We're doing this to ensure that we can do everything possible for the purpose of contact tracing. In the event that a student um, develops symptoms or becomes positive, COVID-19 positive, we want to know all of the students that that student had contact with to the best of our ability. We will continue the cleaning and disinfecting uh, that has occurred uh, in the buildings, we are committed to the high, cleaning the high touch areas throughout the day. Uh, however, we are, um, have invested in Clorox 360 machines, which allow us to fog or wand certain spaces very, very quickly if we determine that a student or a staff member has any types of symptoms. Uh, we also have a, a plethora of PPE, uh, wipes uh, and sanitizer available for our students and staff. We've adjusted some of the key components to our typical school day, which includes not allowing students to use student lockers. So uh, typically, if you've seen a typical school environment, a lot of students crowd around their lockers and we're trying to limit the amount of students that are grouped uh, throughout the day. So students at the grades uh, sixth through 12th grade level will not be using lockers this year. And um, we're asking that students in pre-K through five um, limit the belongings that they bring to school. And we're hoping they're gonna use their chair packs, which are kind of these little uh, organization components that attach to their chair, as well as hang their coats on the back of their chair to prevent them from crowding in the cubby area where typical things are um, stored. We are continuing to limit visitors in our building. In order for visitors to come into the building, there needs to be pre-approval by um, district or building administrators. And at our fall athletic events, we're starting just with our fall athletics for now. Uh, we want to limit our spectators to four, four visitors per student. So if your son or daughter is participating in volleyball or football, you'll have about four. You can bring up to four family members or four fans for each particular student. Um, we are thrilled about our continued partnership with our nurse. She is working with us hand in hand, not only to improve areas of COVID-19, but she has done a number of things um, to help provide a safer environment for our students and staff. So um, defibrillator machines have been installed. Today, she was doing training throughout the district on how to administer EpiPens and other uh, really life-saving medications that are often important uh, in a typical school environment, regardless of COVID-19. So uh, I don't wanna go too far down the list because we could go on and on, but we maintain our commitment to doing everything possible to keep students and staff safe. We are so proud that we had under 30 which is unheard of cases of COVID-19 in our school district over the past year. Um, we implemented these protocols during summer school 
and there was only one case during summer school. I believe that we fared very well, especially when you look at the data, our database compared to neighboring districts. We plan to continue this effort. We know it's extremely important for our students to be in school. Um, and we believe that we are far better prepared now and have received more guidance to um, get our students back to school safely. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Baptiste, our Assistant Superintendent of Teaching and Learning to share more information about our learning plan. Good evening, all. Good evening. Can everybody hear me? A little um, louder. No. Just a smidge louder. Let's come this way. How about oh, now? There you go. Can you hear me now? Okay, so um, I'm going to welcome back first day to all staff. I'm going to share my screen and put it in presentation mode. Uh, here we go. I think everybody can see my screen. Um, so this is uh, an updated version of the learning models presented on June 14th to the board. Um, the recommendation was that we were, we were committed to a 100% in-person learning model for the 2021-2022 school year with a limited virtual option, knowing that we have families who have unique circumstances and students who have unique circumstances. We knew that it was in the best interest of students to be in person, um, the, and, but also having that virtual option, uh, having that as an option, the data indicated that virtual opportunities would be necessary for some families who remained concerned about COVID-19. We wanted to create instructional consistency and uphold instructional consistency. And so not having um, many uh, classes where there was Zoom in the room or where a class uh, got shut down and then you have a new teacher and you know we're in person, but then when you go back, you know we're virtual, then when you go back in person and you have a new teacher, we really wanted students to have consistency and teachers as well. We also wanted to um, make sure that we're providing instruction using our certified Oak Park teaching staff. And so our learning models are on the left-hand side, a full in-person learning model where students would be returning in person this fall. That's upon us. We would have full in-person learning supports, traditional learning models, a K-12 full day schedule. So unlike last year where we had half day hybrid for K-5 and learning hubs for high school, we would have our students fully in person in the classroom with teachers. What we realized when we presented on June 14th, that's actually the day that our um, intent to return uh, surveys that went out to families, we extended it beyond the weekend to June 14th. That's the day that it closed. From there, we were able to make projections for, for what our fall would be looking like based on the families that indicated an interest and our staffing. So we realized from there that um, we had already known at the previous board meeting that pre-K and K would be in person. But what we found was for grades one and two, we didn't have enough families expressing an interest um, for in person. We had, I mean, for virtual, we had more families expressing interest overall for in person. Um, and so when we created our, enroll, our class projections, we saw, well, you know, we're gonna have to create for grades three through 12 and it looks like our families are indicating that for their younger students, they would want in-person instruction more than virtual. Before and after school latch key was something that was also, um, it will be in person and it's a service that our families are indicated that they are interested in and would like to see come back in the fall. So we're going to continue with that. And um, as Dr. Hitchcock shared, based on local public health recommendations, we're following all guidelines, including PPE, um, and having students and staff wear required masks. One of the things that guided or major area, um, an indicator that guided a lot of our decisions was the success of the summer program. We had over 700 students who were in person, close to 70 staff members, and we were in person every single day for six weeks. Um, and it was quite a success overall. So on the other side, we knew that there would have to be a virtual, um, a limited virtual option, and this would have to be by parental requests. And so what that looks like is OPS families that request full online learning at the time that we sent out the um, intent to return, um, 
that we would have our staff or an online self-paced learning platform, one or the other. And so this option is still on the table for virtual and I'll explain why. So for grades three through eight, our students will be in person with an assigned certified OPS staff member and they'll receive live daily instruction Monday through Friday. For students grade nine through 12, if they're taking um, certain electives or courses such as French uh, one or um, like a certain portion of a semester of French and it's, it's not, we're not able to offer a year long um, course in person or uh, not in person, we're not able to offer a year long course, um, yeah, in person. So these students that are virtual, we have them signed up with a platform called Play Plato which is used for each or it's used for credit recovery. However, it does have a feature where it's not just credit recovery where you're making up course credit, you're actually taking the full course in this particular type of a class. So for those unique courses, we were able to collaborate with the high school to identify those courses and who were those students that would be in need of those particular courses. And they would still have um, an advisory or some type of um, connection with a certified OPS staff member. So if it's that French course, they do have the connection with the OPS staff member who teaches French. So they're not just on their own, just taking a class, like there is somebody monitoring their coursework. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a French teacher. It's somebody who's familiar with the platform, making sure that the students are taking their coursework seriously, logging online, supporting them with any next steps that they need. But ideally we would like for still some sort of a connection with um, a staff member that supports that type of instruction. Um, and then we have courses such as one-off electives where there, there weren't any availability on these types of platforms. So those students are eligible to sign up for independent study where they still have an OPS staff member supporting them through that independent uh, study coursework and can receive credit to meet the Michigan Merit curriculum. So after analyzing all of that, we then said, okay, we know that for grades three through 12, we'll have to identify teachers. And before our principals go off on vacation, let's have them identify not only the teachers, but notify the teachers so that they can prepare knowing that they're going to be teaching either a virtual section by grade level or a virtual course um, by content area. So we also wanted to take into consideration our um, students who receive specialized student services that you know, it's illegal for us not, if we're having um, virtual for students who are on a general education curriculum, there may be families according to the IDEA law, we've got to uphold um, equally what we have for our students with special needs as we do for our general education students. So we didn't have the staffing to have virtual sections for um, OSSS students but what we could do was zoom in the room. And we also saw that that was successful for that particular population because they do have paraprofessional staff there who also have district assigned laptops and can communicate and interact with students who are not able to come in person whose families have made that request. So under that, we did the best that we could to make these accommodations. Um, and so that here, oh, I do wanna go back for our students who are, um, who are in a self-contained class, they'll have the support with the paraprofessional and also their teacher where they'll be doing Zoom in the room. But for those students who have an IEP but are in a general education class and receive resource um, classes or resource supports that that teacher would also have a schedule with a Zoom link to support that student and still uphold um, the legality of their IEP and the services that it, they rightfully you know, are eligible for. So. We knew that we really wanted to lean into, and I say we, my team, because we worked on this together and really did as much as we could to collaborate and reach out to um, teachers on our teaching and learning council to lean into the tenets of what we believe in, but also what we know is right and good for students. So we know that students need and staff reliability, opportunities for student attendance, structured routines, opportunities for in-person and social emotional connections and academic supports. We also know that our families after 18 months are also in need of supports and having that in-person connection is important. At the heart of our strategic plan and also our Michigan continuous improvement goals is 
um, a sense of belonging and establishing relationships. And we know that in-person learning builds stronger relationships with both stu students and families. Um, we also leaned into engagement, just the manner in which students are able to engage in hands-on collaborative learning when they are in person and overall our community. And so, you know, just improving social experiences for the entire Oak Park community. And I do, again, refer to the summer as one of the things that we saw um, being a part of Oak Park, um, Oak Park um, Innovation Lab, um, just seeing Oakland Youth Innovation Lab, pardon, just seeing how uh, our neighboring districts that were in school consistently, what the outcome was like for their students you know, just being in community and the consistency of being in person and just being able to um, follow the protocols of being in person as opposed to if we were to go back to learning hubs, you know, that that's the world is the world is moving forward with being in person at this time. And so what are the accommodations that we need to put in place for that, but also keeping in mind, we can't forget our students who are actually virtual. You know, like just because you're an, on a virtual platform, what does that look like? What opportunities do we have to celebrate you? What opportunities do you have to still participate in certain virtual events where you're still a member of the Oak Park community? And so I did skip a slide. Um, this slide is really, I spoke to some of this, but we know that we developed a strong foundation in the 2021 school year. We also know that um, the summer enrichment programs, as, I, as I've spoken to already, um, we've spoken about our district nurses and all of the different COVID-19 training supports and protocols that we've got in place. Even today, we had our district nurses across the district um, providing professional learning in each of our school buildings as staff return to school as a refresh for COVID protocols. But also, if you're new to our district, what are our, our protocols and procedures? So it's something that um, there's ongoing professional development and communication and community building around. So we knew that there were dual benefits. There was a lot that we learned last year that is a benefit. We're meeting here today, but we also have people who are out in our audience who are meeting virtual, who are able to participate with us. So there are dual benefits to what we um, experienced in this past year. So we wanted to make sure that we wanted full day of learning. We didn't really want interruptions in our instructional schedule. Um, we wanted to make sure that we are aligned to the Michigan Department of Education seat time requirements. We wanted our buildings to be fully staffed. All staff would be reporting to school buildings each day, including the teachers who are teaching virtual classes. All students would receive instruction, as I said, from a fully certified Oak Park teacher. And students would follow a full curriculum throughout the school year. And so with that, um, we've got our teachers who are identified for grades three through eight. Um, and we were very uh, intentional about making sure that, let's look at the data. Uh, so if you look at for third grade Einstein, fourth grade key, fifth grade key, the majority of the students who requested to be virtual are from that school community. Although we do have students from Pepper across third, fourth and fifth, the majority of those students were from that particular school community. And for that reason, we asked building principals at the elementary level to select a teacher where the majority of the students were from that school so that in the event that we have to return back, at least that teacher and the majority of those students can continue. And should the parent elect for their child to return back to their home school, they may have that as an option, but at least we know we did everything we could to keep that child with the same teacher and increase um, the likelihood that there's consistent instruction. At the middle school level for grades six through eight, they're following a cohort schedule model. And so all of the sixth grade is in cohort A and it's an AB cohort. Uh, so all of those students would have their core content instruction um, from a math, science, social studies and ELA teacher across the sixth grade. They're all together virtually traveling throughout the day. And for both the elementary and the middle school level, we'll have, um, they have their specials that they receive. And so there's a special schedule that the specials teacher would follow. So the student will still get gym, will still get music, will still get art, whatever is in accordance to their special schedule for the semester or the year. And then finally at our high school, 
we had uh, virtual teachers who were identified and in the high school, it's a little unique. It's by, it's not necessarily by grade level, it's by content area. And so what this does is it shows you as a ninth grader, um, you know, what were, there were course audit, credit audits uh, that, that the principal um, and counselor supported looking through, okay, if you're a ninth grader, what are the courses that you need? Um, and with that, okay, biology, your first period, second period is going to be health. Well, then third period, it will either be nutrition or physical education. And so that schedule kind of breaks down the needs of what the students need by grade level. And each teacher that teaches these kinds of courses are by content area. So that's for high school. And we know that with the COVID variant, you may have some families that are, are concerned even more now and would like the opportunity to enroll their children into a virtual section. Um, and so we still have um, grades three through five, grades K through two is still going to be in person. We have to consider our staffing as well. Um, and so we know that for grades three through five, those are district level seats. And so at the central office, we're able to monitor enrollment for those virtual sections. And what we've asked um, for grades six through 12, they can see the enrollment by class within their respective buildings. And so they're managing, if a family wants to be virtually enrolled or in person, they can contact the middle school or the high school to sort through. But for grades three, four, and five, those are district level classes. So as a, if, if I'm a parent at Pepper and I wanna put my child at Key, you know, but another family member is from Einstein and they wanna put their child at Key, we can't just say, oh yeah, you can just enroll your child. No, we, we actually have to monitor and see um, one, some of the needs of the families, but also first come first serve basis. So we've just got some next steps. One thing to consider is that school of choice, the final deadline is September 3rd. So we're taking that into consideration. September 10th, we have a form that we've shared with families as they call into our district office. We'll also make sure that this is online in a readily available location. If you are virtual and you wish to be in person, um, there's a form that you can complete. And when we see that form for grades three, four, and five, it then lets us know, oh, we've got a virtual seat available because this family has just said that they want to be in person. They no longer want to be virtual. And we've had those requests. Um, same thing for grades six through uh, 12. The schools have a system in place where a family can indicate oh, I, I said I wanted to be virtual, but I actually wanna be in person. How do I go about doing that? So September 10th, Friday, September 10th is the deadline for that. So we know Friday the 3rd is the deadline for school of choice. Friday the 10th is the deadline for, if you're saying that you're virtual, you wanna be in person. Monday, beginning Monday the 13th, we'll start determining virtual section availability, whether, and we've got a right size by count day. So that's on here as well. So the week of September 13th until Friday, September 17th, all families will be notified of virtual availability if they were able to receive a virtual class or not. Um, and we need to make sure that we right size our classes by count day because as it stands for our grade, especially grade three um, is currently uh, over enrolled. So we also wanna make sure we're not over enrolling any of our grade levels, because then what will happen, the teacher is going to be overwhelmed, one. And two, we want to uphold our contract by making sure that they're, they don't have more of a caseload than if they were in person. We have to consider that as well. So by October 6th, we would like to make sure that our classes are right sized. And what this also means is if, let's say third grade right now is at 32, um, 28 is the cap of the class sizes. You can have up to 30, where you pay a teacher um, an additional stipend for having up to 30 students. If we go back in person, let's say in the second semester, you never know. Let's just say we go back in person the second semester. Not that we don't, we're monitoring and, you know, should we ever go back in person for those virtual classes? We want to make sure we're not over enrolled so that we can still maintain social distancing. So we have to make sure we have to really keep that into consideration. The other thing to take into consideration is if your classes, the, the teacher who is in person, if you don't have enough students enrolled virtually, then that means there's more students enrolled in person. So now the teacher who's in person has an overload of students on their, on their um, roster. 
So we're keeping that balance to make sure that that's not the case. And this is our plan. This is our plan of action to support for virtual enrollment. Um, we have just some important updates and schedules today. Teachers reported for professional development. So this is our first day. Next week, we've got our students reporting August 30th. And we've got school schedules. Our, we're following a traditional model, K-5, Monday through Friday, 8.15 to 3.15, grade 6.12, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 7.53 p.m. And um, this is just the same update that we're coming back full force in person with a virtual option per family request. And our next steps are to outreach to families, which we've been doing, making calls to our families to make sure, are, are you still interested in in-person? I mean, are you still interested in virtual? And if not, this is the form, or if a family member reaches out, these are the procedures um, that we're following. Staff communication, we had a teaching and learning council meeting on August the 11th. We had an optional staff meeting on August the 17th, where this was also shared with staff rostering our classes, the support that we're getting from our pupil accounting office around that, and also our building leaders and admin assistants, monitoring virtual enrollment on a regular basis, and our community notice, which even this meeting would also count as a form of community notice and conversation around um, our plans. And I just say cheers to a phenomenal upcoming school year. Thank you. Before I go to the board for questions, did you say our secondary schools are 8 a.m. to 7.53 p.m.? Pardon? AM, 7.53 AM, to pardon, that's a typo. Oh, that's not what it says. So 7.53 AM. I'm sorry, that's 2.53 PM, so two, pardon. Okay. 8 AM to 2.53 PM. We got to keep we, them that long. We love school, we love school, but not that much, <laughs> yes, right? Not Although hard. we're here, right? <laughs> All right, thank you. All right. Um, are there any questions from the board? Uh, I'll start with trustee Goodfriend, then uh, Corcoran, and then Klein. Ms. Batiste. I have to tell you, you, you just had an outstanding presentation and I thank you for it because it's one thing to read, it's another thing to hear. And, and there is a difference for me, okay? And what you've done is in simplistic language that any parent and I, oh, I forget about that. <laughs> I, thank you so much. Um, Got to talk into the mic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Come, coming from me. <laughs> um, no, I lost my oh, the thing that I find so appealing is that it's easy to understand. Now, the things I have to question is if a youngster, if a parent sees a young, uh, young boy or girl, is not having the success in virtual. So there's a cutoff to when they can go into within the, the first month or so before they can uh, go into a full attending classroom. So for that, I would say in a similar fashion, the way we went by card marking period, um, that that would be something that we would monitor for. Um, I, it, it, it can't work both ways where it's like, oh, I want my kid to be in virtual. Oh, I want my kid to be, you know, in person, but the student is floundering. They're not doing well virtually. And the family member really wants them to be in place in person. There are, there will most likely be seats available where we can look enrollment wise and see where will that child, where can that child be enrolled within our district? All right. Now I do know, uh, and I, and I, um, respect our teachers union and the uh, limit, the amount uh, of students in a class. And I respect that. But say um, the, the limit is, the max is 28. If there's 29, is it possible for the teacher to be able to answer that they would be willing to take that over the, the uh, count number? Yeah, there is that as an opportunity where in the contract, they get paid $7 extra a day per student for no more than two students. And it's a stipend that they receive. And so for each, for grades, I'll, I'll keep it to grades three through five, that's 28 is the cap and they can go up to 30. Mm -hmm. So even then there's still a limitation. Um, it, it's like fully maxed at 30. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Then. Um, those 
uh, students who live, reside in this community, okay? And the, say they're in um, the virtual and they're not having success. Would they um, have the privilege, they, their family, have the privilege of consideration of changing a one-time only change uh, before someone that's from uh, outside of the city limits of the school district. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at it as if they're outside the city limit or or from like the tri county area. I think all families, it's kind of like when you have something new going on. There may be some frustration the first week or so, two weeks or so. But at least if we visit the first progress mark marking period, you know. Um, uh, card marking period to then make some type of a determination. There's a conversation with the teacher. There's a conversation with the principal around what, what are the supports that are needed. Um, and then making sure that, you know, we do the best that we can to support. If your child really needs to be back in person, then we're going to do what we have to do to support making sure that they can be back in person. And none of our in-person classes are at full capacity for, in, for, for, um, we're not we're not seeing that for the classes that are in person that they're maxed out. I, I'm sorry. I think Trustee Goodfriend was referring to more of a precedence in regards to students that are in the school district as opposed to those that are correct. not. And we want correct. To, Come back. That's what she's asking. Can I can yeah, I sure. answer that question? Um, by law, we are required to treat all of our students once they're enrolled the same way. Our schools of choice students, as well as our residents, we have to we have to treat them all the, the same way. So if we we have space available. Uh, and a school of a student enrolled in our school of choice program would like to come back in person or if they're an Oak Park resident and they would like like to come back in person, we have to provide that to them. We can't make a difference between how they're enrolled. Um, my choice is students that want to be in person doing everything possible to provide a spot for them in person. I think it's going to be a bit easier to transition at a card marking mark for students who want to return in person than it is for students that are in person that want to return virtual or want to go virtual because we have a limited amount of space. Well, I respect that. I have no problem with that. And I do respect it. I just feel that um, uh, those residents that are part of this community, families, uh, if they if they see that they're the success is not there, and if it's at that first card marking, whatever the uh, timing would be would I would be at the discretion I would uh, suspect uh, of Doctor um, Hitchcock and Miss Miss Patisse You got it. <laughs> Thank you. And. Uh, I, I just want to make sure that we do everything humanly possible for those members of our community. And if it's the first card marking, whatever it is, I can respect that. But I do believe uh, it's just like if a child, a young person is moving into the community. I think that takes precedence. I know it takes precedence. Okay, so I would appreciate that. Uh, I like what you've had to say. Thank you. Thank and you've you. heard how I feel. Trustee Corcoran? Um, yes. Um, President Hoda, um, we didn't get the opportunity to ask Dr. Uh, Hitchcock uh, any questions after uh, her. So this so was one, this was one uh, presentation by both Dr. Hitchcock and Ms. Baptiste about the learning plan. Great, so, so that means I can ask all my questions. Absolutely. Please, please. Okay, is that correct? Yes. Okay, all right. So actually, while we're still on the presentation, I'll address my issues to Ms. Baptiste. Um, it, oh, the um, OSSS, what does that acronym stand for? The Office of Specialized Student Services. Thank you. And um, I, think we need I did, 
I did um, have a question in regards to the um, school of choice final deadline, September the 3rd. Um, so is that, does that mean that if someone wants to enroll, open, in, open enrollment, we have closed that on September 3rd? And if that is so, um, is it because of the room of the students we already have? Like, is that deadline based on a, a number or is it just a cutoff? If you want, you can, yeah. Yes, it's based on the school of choice guidelines mandates by the state of Michigan. So they have indicated that September 3rd is the last date for us to allow uh, schools of choice students who want to enroll under the school of choice program to enroll, which is a bummer because uh, we would like to go beyond that. But unfortunately, uh, that's not our choice. The window opened in March. So I guess they feel like you know, they they want everyone to kind of essentially get where they're supposed to be or enroll where they're supposed to be by the third. Okay, so if the students, I don't know if this is a question that can be answered today, but if that is the case and we have students that are like in limbo, do they just, how, how who, who would they go to if all the, if the state has mandated a cutoff date for those kids that are not enrolled that we can't find, but then all of a sudden they pop up out of nowhere and want to enroll, but now open enrollment is away. So we turn them away and we send them somewhere else because if it's... I, I, yeah, I understand your concern. Um, if the students are not Oak Park residents and want to enroll under school of choice in their essentially not in the queue, I guess what I would call the queue, like they've submitted part of their paperwork and we're waiting for some additional documents, then, um, uh, you know, my thought would be that unfortunately they wouldn't be eligible to enroll here in Oak Park. But if they did have their documents, let's say they did have their documents in the queue and they were missing some key components, but we were waiting on them to submit those things. In my mind, they had already started the enrollment process and we would work with them to get the additional documents in. But if they are, you know, just new to us and they walk in on September 4th, unfortunately, um, under the school of choice guidelines, we would not be able to accept them at that point unless they moved into the school district. Okay, so with that being said, then that would mean that if you are a resident of Oak Park, then there is no deadline. Right, right, absolutely. Oh, okay, so then that would probably lead to uh, maybe uh, students maybe using, do, do we verify that they live here? We do, we do. We, um, you know, one of the things that we did prior to COVID was put together a committee of uh, administrators and who partnered with me and worked with our attorney to ensure that we were asking for proper uh, documents and identification to ensure that students who were enrolling in the district were doing so by following our, our guidelines and policies on how they can enroll in the district. Um, so we, we are verifying all of that information, which can be somewhat daunting. And that's why some of our parents have part of the information submitted and we're working with them to get additional information. But, um, you know, we, even parents that indicate that they are living in the district, we still ask them to provide the documentation that supports that. Okay. Um, the other question I had was, I had more questions on that, but I don't, I don't want to, you know, take too much time on that. I'll, I'll just have to address it later because it just seems as if, um, <coughs> You know, we have where there are a lot of um, laws now that no one can be evicted, uh, you know, and I, I'm just looking at resident wise. So that that is something I guess I would um, talk about later. Well, there are a couple other ways students can enroll if they're homeless or 
Um, if they're living with someone, there are a couple other avenues where students are able to enroll if they meet that really mm, strict criteria. Um, and, and so if, if they meet the criteria, absolutely, we would enroll them. I hope we get to a point where we can also accept students who want to pay tuition to uh, enroll in the district. So um, with the community watching, um, is there a website or a link that they can go on to know what those guidelines or provisions that allow them to know what and If how? you go to our website under enrollment, mm -hmm. um, and I also believe it can be found in our policy, but I would have to confirm that. Um, but all the criteria and information needed for enrollment is on our website under the enrollment tab. Thank you. And, and the, anyone who has a question about enrollment, please don't hesitate to call our enrollment specialist. Her name is Robin Mitchell, and she can be reached at 336-7708. Thank you, Ms. Bechtis. Also, you spoke about the um, summer school. Um, I was wondering, you know, because I know graduates sometime graduate in the summertime, do you know what that um, graduation rate was um, in regards to success for the summer school? Yes, I do. And um, I actually wanted to present, and maybe that'll be the next board meeting, more information on the outcomes for summer school. Um, and so I wanna thank Mr. Derek Falk because he did uh, give data, send data my way. Um, there, were, there were 337 students who enrolled, 592 courses that were scheduled, of that 172 courses that were completed and passed, the percentage of that was, it's 29%. That was the percent. Um, and we had a number of students who, although they were enrolled, that did not uh, get started on the program, even though staff were reaching out to them and just, you know, during the summer, they just, for a variety of reasons, I'm gonna go with, you just wanted to enjoy your summer, but we also know we've got unique circumstances within our community. So I don't wanna just judge and just say, oh, you just wanted to have fun and just do your own thing over the summer. You could have been working, you could have been caring for a family member um, and the staff did everything they could to outreach. So uh, the percentage of courses passed was 29%. Thank you. And I asked that question because I know that, you know, we have, when we have a decline in student enrollment, it, the, per, the percentage is great because we lost the graduates. So I just was curious, was that number included into, you know, the um, graduate rate, you know, that we had, I'm sorry, that was it included into the graduation rate that we initially had, you know, that the amount of um, students that graduated? Yeah, so, not as of yet. Right. And that's also in part for state reporting, not as of yet. And so we may actually have two students who are still eligible to complete courses. And that's what Derek Falk and I were actually meeting tomorrow around um, within that window of those students that are, are willing to continue with doing this type of credit recovery work. What are the supports that we can put in place to help them? Because that uh, reporting is not due as of yet. All right, thank you. Yeah. The other questions I had was for um, Dr. Excuse me, Madam Superintendent. And that was, um, you spoke in regards to the vaccination for the students. Is there a protocol to uh, the students being uh, vaccinated when, like, is there a time? Or are they, should they be accompanied, accompanied by their parents? Um, yeah. Yes, students, um, thank you for asking that. Students cannot be vaccinated or receive immunizations without parent permission. Um, so, um, their parents would need to accompany them for the COVID-19 vaccine, and they would need parent permission for any childhood immunizations. Um, so we would not engage in any of that without parents, uh, parents giving us permission to do so. Okay, the other question, you talked about the enrollment fair, which is a wonderful um, tool uh, to hopefully gather our students enrolled by September the 3rd. Um, I noticed that there were a multitude of outlets that we advertised. Um, is it at all possible that the board can get samples of what went out or 
asked um, techni our technology department to provide us with some of those commercials? We, we don't own the Channel 4 commercials, but I can try to get a copy of that from Channel 4. Uh, I can probably get you the script of what was on JLB and um, some other documentation. Uh, I'll ask Brandon to follow up, gather that information and material and follow, uh, follow up with it. Okay. And like, you know, I guess it would be the example of like where the banners are located, you know, for the community, because we are looking at a deadline now that I didn't even know about. And then maybe the community will um, be able to, you know, drive around or if they are around in the community to see where those banners are, maybe yeah. they can, um, you know, um, you know, let their families know where they can find um, those things. Yes, we, we would welcome and appreciate any community members that want to share the word. Just off the top of my head, I can tell you that there are a few banners on Coolidge Road. There is also a banner on Nine Mile that's kind of on the fence of OPA, but faces Nine Mile. Also uh, at Pepper, um, so students can see that location and at Einstein. Those are the locations that I can think of off the top of my head, but I can get you all of the specific locations. Would it be a city, is it a city code that we can't put them more so like in the busy intersections? Yes, we have some restrictions um, that we learned <laughs> the hard way during the board or during the bond um, election, which is we can only put those uh, banners on our property uh, and we're not allowed to place those those banners like on city property. Um, I think there was some concern about that they would be a distraction to drivers and may contribute to accidents or something. So we can only put it on our district property. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Ms. Baptiste, I just want to clarify something. The 29% course completion rate was that overall or was that specific to our graduating seniors? That was for the students who participated in credit recovery. So that's not our overall graduation rate. Let's make that as a correction. No, that was specifically for the summer program that took place over six weeks. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, Trustee Klein. I noticed that our, our enrollment is down. It's in the, some of the literature that we've got and we've discussed it a little bit. Are there any trends as to the students that uh, we've lost, for example, if they're within district or if they're school of choice students or anything else that we can identify? Or is it just across the board and we don't really know any trend? You know, that, that's a great question. Um, I can't say that I have that information currently, but previous to COVID-19, most of um, the students that we were losing uh, we're at the secondary level. Um, and so we did see a pattern at the secondary level and we're trying to address that pattern. Some of those issues are a result of, um, you know, uh, staff members writing recommendations for students to attend other schools, uh, other school districts. Um, some of those reasons, you know, it's, it's hard to say some were disciplinary. So there are a number of reasons, but at the secondary level, we were seeing the loss of most of our students. Right now we have, um, you know, so much happening with trying to get all of our students retained or re-enrolled in addition to new students in addition to students, to families who for the first time are learning to enroll virtually. So offering some in-person options to provide some assistance for them. So there's a lot of moving parts right now. So we don't have that data. However, um, I'd be happy to follow up once sort of the dust settles and we get to count day and we can see the actual number of students who are enrolled in the district. Do you wanna? Well, I I want to wait for you to finish, but I want to piggyback off of what you just asked. Oh, okay. Um, related question. Just uh, actually a quick follow-up on that. So we're down, if I recall correctly, something like 840 students. Is that, is that about right? 846? Compared to compared to pre two years ago. Yeah. Over, over 700 is a safe estimate. And that's roughly like a sixth. I mean, that's a substantial percentage. Do we know if, 
I'm just curious personally, is that mostly in district or mostly school of choice? Um, I'm sorry to, you know, jump back on this. I know you just said you don't know, but yeah, we, we haven't, we haven't dissected where that 700, that group of 700 students went or, or who they are. Um, what we do know is that um, previously, we didn't necessarily drop students who were not attending. This year, we felt like it was necessary to do so to get an actual accurate picture of who was enrolled in the district and who was not. Um, I can tell you that I personally sign off on every child's packet that enrolls in the district. And I do see a reasonable number of students that say that they have previously been enrolled in the district. Um, you know, a handful of those students out of all of them, but any, any information that I would share tonight would just be a guesstimate and I would hate to do that. Um, we can go back and try to pull that information. It, the first thing that you just mentioned, am I interpreting it correctly? That it's actually possible that the drop-off might be inflated because it's very possible that some of the students that we're now, so to speak, removing from the roles were actually not really attending classes beforehand anyways. That's very possible. Okay. Um, similar, but kind of uh, the inverse. We, uh, we've talked a lot about teacher shortages and I'm wondering what the impact is now on our decreased enrollment if we're still facing a teacher shortage. Um, and if we are, why? So one of the things that uh, we decided to do because the teacher shortage is such a significant crisis, not only in our area, but throughout the nation, is that even though we saw this decline in over 700 students, we decided to maintain all of our teachers, um, with the exception of teachers who maybe retired or resigned and took another position or or requested a leave of absence, we decided not to um, conduct any layoffs, even though we're down 700 students, which right now is equivalent to both Einstein and Pepper Elementary. We did not engage in any layoffs and utilize some of our SR3 dollars or COVID-19 fund dollars to maintain all of our teachers because we wanted to be sure that we had as many teachers as possible available if that number is truly inflated and those students do return to the classroom when we're here in person next week. Of course, and I think it's also advantageous to be able to say we're, you know, come back. We've got the teachers waiting for you. Yes, and, and we wanted teachers who are dead dedicated to our school district that have made that commitment to our students and that are familiar with the school district. And so we wanted to maintain all of the teachers that we could um, with hopes that we're gonna get our students back. Now, what I can say is that our enrollment specialist has been doing a great job in, as well as working with Steve Burnett and Brandon Giles to generate excitement. We have a number of um, prospective students who uh, we just need to verify or gather additional documents. And so I believe that we're trending in the right direction with our uh, enrollment. However, we won't know for sure until we get, and excuse my terminology on this, but the buns and seats count. Um, so when the students are actually here and we can see them, and we can actually count them to know how many students we really have. Um, but absolutely, we wanted to keep as many teachers as possible to combat the teacher shortage and to ensure that teachers are available for kids when they return. As a district right now, are we short on teachers? We have some openings. Um, and I can let Carol speak to the openings that we do have. Uh, nowhere near the number of openings that we've had previously, but um, maybe that's something that Carol can address when she gives her report. Okay, and, and just kind of speak it out loud, the inference that I just got is that uh -oh. we, we, have kept, we have kept teachers because we appreciate our teachers. 
even though in some cases we could have we could have let go and we've used dollars um, that we could have used otherwise because we appreciate our teachers in this district. Oh, absolutely. I was a teacher and I definitely appreciate our teachers. Um, and the openings that we have now are in some specialty areas, if that makes sense. So oftentimes it's, it's a bit harder to um, fill those positions when people get um, promoted or, or get opportunities in other districts. Um, but absolutely, we, we our, our reasoning for using those ESSER dollars to prevent any type of layoffs was to demonstrate to our teachers that they are valued and we care about them and we want them to stay in Oak Park School District. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions from the board? Trustee Goodfriend. Uh, when we're talking, Dr. Hitchcock, in regards to the population, the drop in uh, the, the number 800, of the 800, how many were graduates? You know, that's a, that's a great question. I would not include the, our graduating seniors in that 700 population. Um, that's so net, right? the decline in enrollment, I don't know that I would necessarily include them, but let me let me look into that to be sure, because I don't want to misguide you or give any uh, inappropriate information. But I believe that that does not include our graduating seniors. So, because we know when uh, when our graduates leave, how many was in the graduating class? Are you familiar with that number? If I'm not mistaken, it was about two seventy. Pardon me. Somewhere in the two seventies. Okay. So I would suspect that that's an inclusion. I would suspect, but I would hope that you could uh, investigate that and bring that information to the board. With, with Ms. Goodfriend's point, can I just clarify that when we're talking about the 700 drop-off, that's net, correct? That's, that's everybody we have now minus everybody that we had before. Yes. So it includes also it includes the outgoing, but it also includes the incoming. Right. So the number of seniors who graduated doesn't I don't think it factors in, but I don't want to speak out of turn. Right. So I want to okay. be as accurate as possible. So I I just want to double check that to be okay. certain. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other questions from the board? Then we move to reports. Our first report is from our superintendent, Dr. Hitchcock. <laughs> okay. Good evening, officially, again. Um, I just want to share just a few updates. First, I'd like to start by thanking all of the staff uh, that participated in our opening day this morning and all of the hard work that went into facilitation in all of our buildings by our building principals. And I would be remiss if I did not uh, recognize a, a few very important folks. And so to, as part of our opening day, in addition to Mr. Hoida, we had um, two of our students uh, who I believe are on the call now who were featured in a great video about the Oakland Youth Innovation Lab. And those students are Veronica Compton and Makai Daniels. Um, we were very proud that they were involved in the oil program and are very appreciative of Ms. Baptiste for making that happen for all of our students. Um, in addition to the students being featured in the video that was shared today, we also had three teachers who presented um, on their experience in the oil um, program. And those three teachers were Ms. Orman, Ms. Fuller, and Mr. Bondano. And they did a wonderful job articulating how incredible the experience was in teaching in sort of a project-based environment where they were truly the facilitators and the passions of the students guided their uh, interest. 
and it guided their learning. Uh, in addition to those three teachers, our other uh, folks that were involved at the high school level were Emily Dela Cruz. She was our, is our instructional coach, and she was the um, site leader, as well as Dr. Sharon Lewis and Mary Western. So they were all involved in the OIL program and definitely appreciative of um, all of, of their involvement. Um, I, I would also like to highlight uh, Emily Monville, who is the art teacher at Key. She has worked extremely hard to paint some beautiful murals um, at Key Elementary School that are rich in, in print. So uh, letters are painted on the wall in our kindergarten uh, hallway area. And so we know that how important it is to have a print rich environment. And uh, we're so appreciative of Emily Monville's hard work that went into making that happen for the students at Key Elementary School. Uh, additionally, uh, I, I'm not sure there was so much information that was shared earlier by Mr. Melcher, but I, I wanna make sure that we highlight for our community how hard uh, Mr. Nye and his team have worked to ensure that our teachers come back to what we've coined as model classrooms with audio enhancement systems. So some of you may be thinking, what do we need audio enhancement for? Well, it's all that we've been doing on this stage to kind of communicate with each other in this small space, but not having a microphone, especially with masks on can be difficult. And now teachers have the ability to do that in their classrooms. Of course, teachers all receive new laptops and they will now have um, display or docking monitors to utilize their laptops on the go and in different classroom spaces, as well as at their desks. They have laptop carts and many of our teachers received um, new Promethean boards as well. So uh, our classrooms have been equipped with many of these new technologies and we're very excited to share those with students in addition to closing the digital divide essentially in Oak Park, um, because we have provided with students with laptops to use at home and in person, or and in person here at school. Um, I would also like to, to make sure that all of our community members are aware of our change in the dress code. Um, you know, we highlighted the importance of student voice today. And what is fabulous about student voice is that when we can listen to students and ensure that they are part of the decision-making process for some of these big decisions, we try to do so. And we heard a lot of feedback from our high school students, as well as our administrators about um, our dress code po policy. And so, the dress code pilot for this year has been relaxed and um, it has some basic principles to um, make sure all body parts are covered appropriately and that students have on shirt, pants, shoes, um, but we're, we're not dictating exactly what all of those things look like. So we're excited about giving some students the freedom of expression and having some autonomy to wear what they would like to school and not allow that to serve as a barrier for their attendance um, at school, which we were finding that some of our students were struggling with when their uniforms were not clean or laundered to wear their school. And so we're excited about that. It is a pilot. We had many, many students, parents, and staff members participate in our survey that contributed to the pilot for this year. And then finally, on a sad note, uh, 2006 graduate Kevin Lucas II uh, passed away, um, and there is a candlelight vigil scheduled on August 25th at 7.30 on our football field, and that vigil is being led by Miss DA because the student was an instrumental part of the uh, drama 
community at our school. So um, please join me in uh, expressing our condolences to his family. And if you are able to attend, please don't hesitate to join us on August 25th at 730. Uh, and the funeral arrangements will, will take place in Texas. So thank you. That's all I have to share this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the board? I don't. I don't have a question. It's okay, a Trustee Smith, and then Trustee Corcoran. Yes. Yes. I don't have a. I don't have a question. I actually have a comment. I was able actually to participate in the uh, registration over at the high school um, recently, and I just want to commend the staff and the team um, in regards to uh, the easy flow of the process. And I sent out a message to. Um, Dr. Hitchcock in, informing of that, but I want to share it with the, with the board and with the community. Um, it, was, it was, to me, it was practically seamless. You know, a lot of, it was so good to see parents and students in, you know, uh, with their level of enthusiasm to return to school. Um, and I, I was able to witness that and, you know, just, I just watched, I watched, I watched everybody and it was just really a good feeling. Um, I do want to also just I want to I want to commend Makai Daniels um, in, in regards to his leadership and his willingness to participate and, and his willingness to participate and, and take a leadership role. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of him. and I like what I, what I see in his growth. So I just want to let that be known. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Trustee Corcoran. Yes, to piggyback on that, um, I have actually saw exactly what you're seeing, um, even on the social media. Um, I had, you know, a few of my high school um, classmates where their son, you know, is now enrolled in Oak Park. I didn't know, but, you know, just to see the, um, the joy of the students coming back in person, it was a delight um, to see that. But I did have a question um, for um, Madam Superintendent. Um, in regards to the, um, the um, uh, what fund is that called? It's the ESSER, the ESSER fund. Mm -hmm. um, I just, the question that I had was, um, what is the projection of that fund and what is it used for? Currently, we're using it to prevent layoffs for teachers. Oh, okay. All right. And, um, oh, and that was it. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? All right. Then our next report is from our assistant superintendent for teaching and learning, Ms. Beth Beats. So my report was primarily the learning models. I did want to take a moment just to thank um, Jason Hafner, Katie Morrison, who's out on maternity leave, Shayna Holden Murphy, who is now the principal at Key Elementary, Grayling Mercer, and uh, who are, these are all members of the teaching and learning team, Lisa Davis, the executive assistant, but also a, a, a really new member to our team, um, and she's here in the audience, Jackie Smith. Uh, the director for uh, student services, who was very instrumental in just making sure like we are upholding the needs of our special needs students um, as we uh, move forward with our plan. So I really, it's been a joy working with you so far, Jackie, and all the best for this year and many more. Um, and also just to give, I have to do my New York City way, a shout out to our summer school, all the teaching staff, um, and a special shout out to our summer school leaders Amber Miller and Brandy North, who really held space for our families, our students, and did a rock star job um, over the course of the summer. So there's that. Um, and then just our August professional development, our district uh, PD plan for 2021 to 2022. And I know Dr. Hitchcock will speak much more to this as well over the course of the year that we're centering elevating student voice. Um, and that was very much evident in, it's very much evident in our agenda and um, just centering family engagement, community sense of belonging for staff, students, and families, um, increasing student attendance, the collaboration we have with the organization Attendance Works, which, which is an, an internationally and more so nationally recognized organization. Um, the recent implementation of iReady as our benchmark assessment and intervention program, and all the curriculum planning that has gone on centered on accelerated 
uh, student learning. I just want to thank every single staff member that makes I'm up here on the stage alongside you all, but there's a whole team of people that do a lot of things behind the scenes for our families and our students. And I just want to thank each and every one of you. Cheers to a new year. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Then we move to our next report, which is our Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources, Ms. Diglio. Thank you. Um, I too wanted to welcome back all of our returning staff. And then of course, welcome our new staff. Um, there was a question earlier. We are welcoming about 13 new staff right now. They're either on the board report this evening or in the process of onboarding. And some of that um, does include paraprofessionals and administrators. Um, and I, I really need to thank Aliyah Cheney and Shelly Sherman and all the administrative team and even some teachers that participate um, in our interview panels. Um, we really are um, staying strong to our hiring practices as presented in June and uh, making sure we're bringing the best and, and the brightest to Oak Park and the right people. Um, so I just want to thank everyone who's continues to participate in that task, but also want to um, thank everyone in advance for supporting our newest Oak Park staff members and giving them a warm welcome, um, not just this first week or first month, but throughout the year and, and uh, working together to um, onboard them um, in the buildings. I also want to thank our building leaders and staff for engaging in COVID-19 training today. I know that uh, Dr. Hitchcock had mentioned the protocols going into the meeting, and I appreciate that greatly. Um, but we do um, work together as a team, and our building leaders led uh, training this afternoon in all the buildings with our staff. So I appreciate the staff and our leadership teams uh, holding um, our expectations and our safety protocols that are in place and maintaining them um, for our students and um, for each other. Uh, I wanna thank Mr. Burnett and DM Burr for all their hard work behind the scenes with making sure PPE supplies get in the buildings and in the classrooms and, and making sure we're prepared for our students coming back on Monday. Not so much of a report as much as a reminder. I think I, I, it's really helpful for all of our staff to take time to log on to staff links, especially at the beginning of the year. You're gonna find a number of helpful items to navigate through the school year. It should be your go-to place. Um, new this year are all the calendars, OPEA, OPESPA, administrative calendars, GSRP calendars. They are all available on staff links. You all went through COVID training today and all of the COVID protocols and the manual are on staff links. Collective bargaining agreements are present there, your employee handbook, payroll schedule, advanced informa uh, attendance information, whom to ask document, and just a number of um, district-wide forms that you uh, may need to access at one time or another during the school year. The, um, Real big reminder is if you're a returning staff member, you need to use your old email address and password. If you're a new staff member, meaning new to Oak Park Schools, your newly assigned email address will work for you to access those. And to, if you're not sure what I'm talking about, please ask a colleague or just simply call me at 7713 and I'm happy to walk you through all that. Um, there's been a lot of talk about immunizations and vaccinations this evening and, and the, um, the in-person registration and orientation, as um, we had mentioned. One of the strategies behind having and hosting in-person registration and orientation was to, in fact, bring people back to campus. But as you all know, since um, June, of, June of 2020, or really even earlier, we have been working hard to get all of our students that attend Oak Park schools immunized. This has been a bit of a challenge. One of the um, things that I need to remind everybody is that if your child is not up to date with their immunizations or do not have a waiver from the health, health department, they cannot attend in person. That is state law since 1978. This is my first time I've seen MDE come out with a letter just prior to school starting. Um, with the global pandemic, they are, are um, reminding all school districts in the state 
that this law is in place and that we are not to allow kids to come in person if they are not up to date with their childhood immunizations. Um, so one of our strategies was to host in-person registration and orientation to make it easier for families to uh, come in person. Uh, Nurse Long, Shelly Sherman worked diligently on getting all of the MICR reports up to date along with the building secretaries. And we partnered with Oakland County Health Department and Ascensions so that if parents and kids showed up for those registration orientation and were not fully immunized, we were able to put them at a station right there on campus. I'm pleased to say that we immunized probably close to 90 students during that week. We still have more to go. Um, and we also offered COVID-19 vaccinations as an option for those who wanted it. And we were able to vaccinate about 15 kids. But the, the big target was the immunizations and we're still working hard there. And a huge thank you to uh, Oakland County Health Department. This is a super busy time for them and they have um, partnered with us. Um, and Ascensions is always available. If you cannot get into your pediatrician, you need to call Ascensions that's located in the high school. It's on our website, make an appointment so that they can get your child immunized before the 30th. Um, as mentioned also, there was some trainings that went, went on with uh, Nurse Long and N Nurse Sabbath for in-person training, their big four anaphylaxis uh, training with EpiPens, asthma training, seizure training with diastats and diabetes. Plus they went over emergency response and safe legal aspects of school health. We focused a lot on COVID-19. You've heard me say for the last two years, we also are doing a lot of work with just general school health. And so we picked that up again today. So in addition to COVID-19 training, they had some general school health training. Um, I also wanna uh, just mention that um, I am greatly appreciative of all of our staff and in one of our groups, our OPEA, there is a wage reopener for that membership. Uh, we do have a meeting scheduled in the September, but I remain optimistic that our student enrollment will continue to grow. And I just wanted to thank everyone in advance for their patience during this time and know that we are open um, to our, uh, the communication and ongoing sharing of information as it comes in. So thank you so much. I wish everyone a wonderful school year and it was so great to see people in person today. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Trustee Corcoran? Yes. On um, the question I had is you stated that there was a challenge. Why do you think there's a challenge for the students to, um, to be immunized? So um, it, I've been reporting for the last few years and what we recognized prior to 2019, there was a disconnect with enrollment and immunizations. So students would come and enroll and be told you have to be immunized, but there wasn't a check, a check factor to make sure they were immunized. So the state requires us to report kindergarten, seventh grade, and new to the district. We're a school of choice, so we're always bringing in new to the district. So what ended up happening is over time, kids would enroll, but we weren't double, triple checking their immunizations. So by the time they got to seventh grade, there was a much higher number of unimmunized students than anticipated or allowed by the state. We're required to have 95% or more of our kids immunized, or it could be a 5% state aid penalty. So we have been working hard um, on getting the information out and getting our checks and balances in place so that we can assure that kids are coming to school with their childhood immunizations or a waiver. Um, I mean, that, that's really what has happened over time. I think there's lots of reasons why it may not have occurred prior to, but one thing that will change culture is, and it will be tough the first year, but holding the line that if you're not immunized, we can't let you in person until you get immunized. And we've been working with families. There's been endless communications going out in the last two years. We've hosted, even during COVID in the winter, immunization fairs. I've, I've shared that information with you over time. Um, and we've met with the Oakland County Health, Health Department to explain what we're, what we're working with and how we want to improve our immunizations. 
and they um, partnered with us this summer to come in person during this registration and orientation. So what you're saying is, is that it kind of goes, it has me going back to that, that deadline date of September the 3rd. So the kids that are, that we're waiting to be immunized, they're already enrolled or they're new coming to the district and their, their status is not up to date? Uh, both. So that's a great question. Some, because all families, even if you were a current student, you had to re-enroll. And so we were able to um, train all of our administrative assistants in the buildings, principals, and then my office uh, with Nurse Long and Shelly Sherman monitor and look what's called the MICA report. And that's where all the childhood immunizations are housed in Michigan. So now that more people are able to access that report, if you are, if you have been here and have not had your childhood immunizations, we have been reaching out to families since 2020. We have done it in writing, so many phone calls that they were getting angry at us calling. Um, but we have been communicating with our current students and then in enrollment, if you are new to the district, we can't fully enroll you and give you a schedule until you're immunized. And we're still working on that process. We'll continue to refine it and work with our families uh, so that it, it, we, we're working together. So are they given a deadline? Because if, if it's crunch time at September 3rd uh -huh. and these students who are not immunized would that give room for another student who is completely 100% ready to go to be enrolled? That's possible. Um, we've been giving deadlines for years, like months. We've been, we gave deadlines prior to going to in-person last April. We did communications then and reminded families that if you are choosing to come in person starting April 5th, you had to be immunized to come in person. So we have been giving deadlines, communications, um, uh, very regularly. So you say, and it's on our website as well. So they have to be immunized in person, but they have to be immunized virtual also, right? Yeah, that is what we would prefer. Um, yes, they do. They should be immunized right. um, or have a waiver. Okay. Um, and so they. Um, that's a great question too. Yes. Everyone, all, your, all the children attending should have their childhood immunizations, but we can't allow them in person if they don't. Okay. I, I was just trying to cover the sure. enrollment rate right now. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Diglio? All right, Trustee Lunkins, can you please read the public participation? She's on mute. Trustee Lunkins, you're muted. She just turned the page. She figured it out. Okay. Oh dear. <laughs> Members of the audience are invited to participate at board meetings. Prior to the business portion of the meeting, following conclusion of reports, and prior to the adjournment of each meeting, you will be recognized by the board president and asked to give your name and address before <clears throat> making your comments. The board president. Oh, please present a concise statement of your concerns. The board president may choose to limit your presentations to three minutes in order that all who wish to speak may have the opportunity to do so. Please, thank you for your cooperation. We welcome your inputs and appreciate your presence at our meeting. If anyone is disabled and needs special accommodations at the Board of Education meetings, Please contact your superintendent's office at 336-7705, and it's 248, seven days prior to the meeting. Thank you. So um, members of the audience who are here in person can step up to the podium to make public comment. Members of the audience who are participating virtually can indicate by raising their hand in the participants tab or by indicating in the chat that they'd like to speak and I will call on them to provide public participation. A reminder that um, if you have questions that you'd like answered,
please refer those to the appropriate building administrator or to central office. We cannot engage in um, two-way communication during public participation, but we appreciate your comments and we'll take them under consideration. At this time, I don't see any hands raised or um, messages in the chat or people at the podium here. So we will move forward. Uh, I'm sorry, I see uh, Ms. Haichu has raised her hand. Ms. Haichu, go ahead. All right, hi. Um, so it's been a little while, about close to a decade since I've been here to speak. Um, I'm Margo Haichu, 31340 Pagels Drive. We're in Michigan and I just want to um, just read a brief statement that I have. Uh, I'd like to express some concerns I have regarding the alleged freeze or withholding of a step or salary progression, however we wanna call it. I am utterly disappointed and disheartened as a teacher of 15 years in this district. Number one, it has become apparent that the July 1st budget did not include a step increase. One could argue that this alleged freeze was the intention from the beginning. Number two, um, I am confused as to why, upon learning of this, the board of learning of this non-step increase, the board uh, budget was approved. Or excuse me, the board approved the budget and not revisited it or sent it back for revision. Um, number three, I would like to remind the board and central administration that not too long ago, the teachers took a five percent pay decrease. Um, went a negative step and were frozen for a number of years to create a fund equity in lieu of an $8 million or so uh, budget uh, deficit, okay? Um, for this district in good faith that somewhere in, somewhere in the future, we would be offered some gratuity. In reality, the reason we are initially in the black is literally due to the staff. Here we sit with a fund equity of 20 million as of July 1st with a projected rainy day fund of approximately 14 million as of June 2022. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And we will move forward now with our agenda. There will be another opportunity for uh, public participation at the end of the meeting. And we have our first action item, action item 7A. Um, Trustee Goodfriend, can you read that please? I'm sorry, but it's too dark. I can't, <laughs> uh, I can't read today. Okay, Thank Trustee you. Corcoran. 7A. Yep, one second. I can't see it. It's a handicap. It's coming up here. Result of Will Park Board of Education. Uh oh. I pulled the wrong one up. Come on, help There it is. I forget. Oh, it's right in my face. Okay. Resolved that the Oak Park School Board of Education approved the Oakland County School Board's Association Resolution um, as presented. Is there a second? Second. Sure. Moved by Trustee um, Corcoran, supported by Trustee Lunkins. Are there any questions or comments from the board on the resolution? Uh, Trustee Klein. Yeah, the the version that I have in the board books doesn't actually have the resolution. I just have the page that says that we can approve or disapprove. Were we actually, were we actually okay. given the resolution? So the, the actual resolutions were emailed to all the board members by Carol Finkel, Finkelstein, the president of the OCSBA several weeks ago. Um, there are, said. if you wish I can, Sir. there are a number I, I can pull those up. 
It's in the board packet. Yeah, I, I don't see yeah, that. Right. I looked through the whole board. thing. It is. It's in Couple. I'm sure it's here. It's All right. right. Um, I, I will mention that um, among the legislative updates that are included in this, one of them would change the Oakland County School Board Association's position on support for the School Finance Research Collaborative proposal. So in the past, the Oakland County School Board Association was supportive of the recommendations of the School Finance Research Collaborative. This proposal would say that we are supportive of it, um, provided that all districts are held harmless. And I have concerns about that qualifier. The School Finance Research Collaborative laid out a roadmap for the state of Michigan for how we get to a successful education for all our students. That was a process that was led by Oakland schools. And in, we should be a leader in that effort rather than qualifying our support um, by any means. Certainly, if we want to say that um, we hope that all school districts are held harmless, that that's a preference. That's certainly something that the Oakland County School Board Association can state. But in this resolution, which would qualify our support for the School Finance Research Collaborative, I am opposed to that. And I um, would encourage my fellow board members to join me in voting against approval of these OCSBA legislative um, resolutions. Is there anything else for members of the board? All right, Ms. Gerke, the question is on approval of the OCSBA legislative resolutions. Can Ms. Greer, can you please call the roll? Oda? I'm sorry. No. Oh, no. Good friend. No. Smith? No. Klein? Abstain. No. Alvin. No. We move on to 7B. Trustee Elvin, can you read that one, please? Thank you, Vera. I got it. And I and I see now it's include the resolutions are in the are in board book under this resolution. Yes. Resolved that the Oak Park Board of Education approved the proposed amendments to the Oakland County School Board's Association bylaws as presented. Yeah, yeah. Is there a second? Second. Board. Moved by Trustee Elvin, supported by Trustee Smith. Do any board members have questions on this resolution? Once again, I would like to encourage my fellow board members to vote against this proposal. Included in the bylaw amendments would be a um, would be to give the OCSBA Board of Directors the power to reduce its size from nine to seven. Um, in we have a very diverse county in many different ways. Our board of OCSBA has not, in my opinion, always um, reflected that diversity. The board has stated that the reason they are proposing to reduce the number of, of members of the board is that they have trouble finding members to, uh, finding board members who are willing to run for those seats. Um, my feeling is that if that's the issue, they should work uh, at recruiting and reaching out to a larger swath of the Oakland County School Board Association membership. By reducing the number of seats, it would reduce the opportunities for people that are not currently represented, districts that are not currently represented, um, populations that are not currently represented, areas of the county that are not currently represented to run for seats on the Oakland County School Board Association. And so for that reason, I encourage my fellow board members to vote against this resolution so that we can work to make OCSBA more diverse, more representative, um, the current makeup of the board of education of the Oakland County School Board Association board represents um, contiguous districts. You could literally walk from one district to the other and cover the entire population of the OCSBA board. Um, and we are a county that's far larger than that and should be reflected, in my opinion. Can I make a comment? Please. It 
just on that particular note, it's my understanding that the current bylaws actually don't specify the numbers. So couldn't the current board of directors just drop down to even less than seven? So um, the there is in the current bylaws a mechanism for the board to seek candidates um, who would consider being appointed to empty seats, which is what they state that they're intending to do to fill the current empty seats. But what they have stated in their communication is that in the future they're concerned there may be even more of a drop off and they may have to um, reduce the number of board members in order to meet that requirement. But even if this doesn't pass, and it, what this says is there shall not be less than seven, but the current bylaws don't have any ceiling or any floor rather. So it could go down to three under the current status. And there is certainly, I, I would agree with you that the bylaws should be amended to state the number of, of a, to state the number of board members that are required. The, the current bylaws do not have that at this point, yes. Okay. <laughs> but the, the way, position. the mechanism by which we have to vote is only to vote up or down their proposals. So the way, the way these things are, we as, a, we as members do not have an opportunity to make amendments. Only the, the board can propose bylaws and then the membership can either vote for or against. And that's, that, that's, the, that's the way the, it's set up. Are there any other questions? Ms. Greer, can you please call the roll? Alvin? No. Corcoran? No. Klein? Yes. Smith? No. Oda? No. Good friend. I'm not voting at all. I'm not intelligently trained, told what this was about other than reading materials. There was no discussion at this board table. Monkins. Jane. So I want to be clear, we have four no's, one yes, and two abstentions. Abstain. What did Claudette vote? Abstain. She said yeah. Okay. Okay, so in, in our bylaws, board members cannot abstain if there is um, not a majority. So those board members that abstain will have to, the chair will require them to vote. There are, there are four no's. Isn't that a majority of the vote of the board? I believe there's three no's, three no, abstentions, and one yes. Four, four, four no's, two abstentions, and one yes. Okay, I, I missed that. So I had, oh I had trustee Goodfriend, trustee Lunkins, and trustee Corcoran abstaining. Is that wrong? No. I didn't okay. vote at all. But You've got your. That's an abstention. That's right. You got four calls. Uh -huh. no. paying attention. Alvin Culprin, Smith, and Hoda. So Culprin voted no. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. I misheard that. Thank you. So that resolution is defeated. We move on to information items. And the first one is regarding um, our March 28th board meeting, which is during spring break. <laughs> Um, so does the board wish to change that meeting date to a different date um, and amend our board calendar? That's the discussion. And if it's the will, if the board would like to do that, we can, uh, we can change that. Is there anything that prevents us from meeting when the district is on vacation? What? I'm sorry. To there, there's question. nothing that prevents us from meeting when school is out other than the, um, the superintendent, the administration, and the staff who support who are supporting putting a meeting together um, will be will it will require them to be in district during a time that otherwise um, it's vacation be, time. I'm sorry. It's otherwise vacation time. Correct. I, I'm I'm having trouble hearing you. <laughs> uh, it's otherwise vacation time. Is that correct? It would, otherwise, it would otherwise be an ideal time for them to be on vacation, yes. Is 
Is there any other board discussion on moving the board date? The, the meeting date? What's the, what's the negative, what's the negative output in not moving it? What's the negative? The negative in not moving it would, would be that, um, we, I mean, we can eliminate that date altogether if we want, um, but that's the, the calendar we approved includes that date. So if we're gonna change it, we have to vote to change it. So am I hearing that the board is in support of eliminating that date or do we wanna change it to a different date? I mean, are we open to political discussion right now? This is the time for discussion. That's the okay. forum. Leave it as it is. We should look for an, an alternative. Trustee Lunkins? Even if, if we agree to change it, we still gonna have to make up another date anyway, right? Okay. So we just I'm, leave it at Sorry, Trustee Lunkins, I'm having trouble hearing you. I said, if we decide to change the date, we're going to eventually have to come up with another date for that. Um, so we could either come up with another date or we could eliminate that date from the calendar and just it's meet a, at the next scheduled date. Just, just leave it as is. Okay. Just leave it as is. It's a matter of the inconvenience in there. I'm not in favor of inconveniencing any of the board members here. What is inconvenience me? I, I actually like to make a motion to move that date. Yes. Okay. Is there any other discussion? Or what you could possibly eliminate again? Trustee Elvin? I was just curious if you had a proposed date to move it to. That's the no. now. It would if we pass if we pass something. But we pass them all. My, my thing is, I would hate to, you know, if it's a spring break and the school is out and, yeah. you know, we have teachers or staff members that are on vacation during that time, I don't want to inconvenience them. I know if I, the shoe is on the other foot, I wouldn't want to be inconvenienced. So, Do we have the exact school schedule handy to know when the vacation is? That we, we, we do. That is posted on our website. Oh, okay. That's only fairness. I'm just putting myself on the other side. I agree. You know. I, I think Trustee Smith has a point about moving it so we don't wind up with a double long meeting in the uh, first April meeting, which would also be the last meeting before Passover. So, so what's the proposal? So actually, well, well, based on the dates of the vacation, we would move presumably to the week before or the week after, or we put up a vote. I know you want to stand up here. Not stated on the calendar. <laughs> Excuse me, President Holder. Are you looking for the calendar um, for the school year for 2022? I'm looking at my own calendar for March to see um, what's happening the week before and what's happening the week after. Oh, you mean your your personal uh, calendar? So I, I would be a so either one would would be fine to me if you want to meet April 4th or March 21st. Because Trustee Elvin? I, I move that we alter the 2021-22 board meeting calendar to change the March 28th, 2022 meeting to March 21st, 2022. Support. So the motion was moved by Trustee Elvin and supported by Trustee Smith. Do any board members have questions? Would you repeat the motion, please? The, mo the motion is to move the March 28th meeting to March 21st. I agree. And to amend our calendar as such. Absolutely. 
Yes. Okay. Bye. Any questions? I'll support that. Ms. Greer, can you please call the roll? Lunkins? Yes. Good friend? Yes. Hoda? Yes. Smith? Yes. Klein? Yes. Copring? No, I mean, yes. And Alvin? Yes. Um, the next item for information is the MASB 2021 Delegate Assembly. The MASB conference is scheduled for November in Grand Rapids at the Amway Grand Plaza Hotel. Um, any board member that wishes to attend can register and you can speak, you can do that either yourself through the MASB website or through Ms. Greer. Um, you, I believe there is, they are having both in-person sessions and virtual sessions. I know I'm giving a session which is gonna be virtual. Um, as of this time, they are still having the in-person sessions. The delegate assembly, I was trying to read through the language. It looks like the delegate assembly will be in person. So if there are board members that are planning to attend in person in Grand Rapids and would like to represent the district on the delegate assembly of MASB, um, you can, uh, we can consider that. I believe we have two spots plus an alternate. So are there any board members that plan to attend and be there Thursday night in person and would like to be um, considered for the delegate assembly? Trustee uh, Corcoran? No, I have a question. Yes. I mean, well, actually I have a statement. I spoke with Cindy today and from my understanding, she stated that there wouldn't be any virtual because uh, I had registered for my last class for my certification um, back two months ago. Um, because I don't think they knew that they were going to have the conference. And what she explained to me is that um, that they're not going to have virtual. But I can clarify that. But as far as I know, that's why she called me. Because I, I thought that I was going to be in that class virtual. Okay. Um, as far as the delegate assembly, are there any board members that would like to be considered to represent the district on the delegate assembly? Yeah, I would like to. I would. Like Trustee Smith. Yes. Speak in your mind. Yeah, I would. I would like to be. Yeah, I would like to be considered. Um, but I do want to verify what is the uh, platform. Is it going to be? They send that virtual, to us. Or is it going to be? Oh. Uh, because of the fact that you know we have. Yes, to you're right. It, because we have to uh, get approval to attend be the board. So right. that's right. So, so, so right now, I'd like to say right. uh, tentatively, mm -hmm. I would like to represent. Okay. So since I'm going, and if it's not in person, then you're saying you can go ahead, right? But if so it's you're gonna in, two, you're going to need two. Oh, yeah. I'll be there. Okay. And okay. alternates. Okay. So I'll. I'll yeah. So is there any objection to Trustee Smith and Trustee um, Corcoran being our delegates to the delegate assembly? No. All right. Um, I think they'll do great. What's that, Trustee Fine? I think they're great choices. I do too. Okay. If there's no objection, I'll consider it unanimously approved. I don't know why. Um, I'm sorry, I just realized we, um, going back to our action items, I yeah. forgot about our personnel actions. So I'll ask for a motion to approve the personnel re recommendations. I'll make a motion. Go ahead. I'll make a motion that we approve the personnel action for uh, August 23rd, 2000, 2021. Okay, so the motion is to approve the personnel recommendations that are made in the personnel action report of August 23rd. Is there a second? Second. I asked for it to be placed on. Yeah, so that, so now, now it's, it's being moved for action, so there's time for discussion. There you go. Okay. Trustee Goodfriend, do you have a question? I or need discussion? to have a clarification in regards to, it's a two-part question. How many nurses do we have in our district? We have one um, full-time district nurse, and we are proposing to add Maddie Sabbath as a part-time nurse who's been um, working with our district all of last year. She was assigned to us 
um, from Oakland County Health Department. And so uh, we asked her to become part of our part-time, a part-time nurse as needed, no more than eight to 10 hours per week. Um, it looks like it might, we might only get her every other week for about a day, but that will help with a lot of the additional training that we had through COVID. Um, it also will help uh, Ms. Long in um, making sure that all of the uh, health plans are up to date. If it involves like EpiPens, diastats, um, students with diabetes, um, and it, she will also assist with our um, immunizations um, MICR reporting that we've been doing. Thank you. But we have, right now, we only have one full-time. And that's what we had last year was one full-time. Is that correct? We had um, both of them. Maddie was assigned to us from the Oakland County Health Department, but the Oakland County Health Department and Oakland Schools is no longer assigning nurses to our district. So she, we, we needed the additional help, and she was amazing um, with our, our students and our staff last year. Oh, so the next part of that question I asked, the part-time last year was sent uh, as gratis to us from Oakland County. Is that correct? That's correct. Oakland, Oakland County paid for her That's what to I mean. be here. That's correct. Okay. And now it would be a more cost. Right. I think first... Oh. Are there any other questions from the board on the Thank motion? You. Any other questions from the board on the motion to approve the personnel recommendations? All right, Ms. Berkey, please call the roll. Cochran? No. Alvin? Yes. Good friend? No. Hoda? Yes. Klein? Yes. Lunkins? Yes. And Smith. Yes. Motion is approved. Um, the next item on our agenda is the City of Oak Park property yeah. tour debrief. Trustee Goodfriend, Trustee I'm, Elvin. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. I know we, we made the motion that passed. I'm just curious of why nobody can ask that. Uh, tr trust so go, 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 going back to our agenda trustee regarding the oak park uh the city of oak park property tour trustee good friend trustee elvin and myself together with mr burnett um ms greer and dr hitchcock um a couple of weeks ago toured the three sites that the city or three of the sites that the city was is proposing that we consider for development. We, we met at Pepper School. We went then to Einstein and then to Lessinger. They showed us the areas they were talking about. Um, there wasn't any significant information provided that I can remember that was different from what was presented in Mr. Um, Tungate's presentation to us. But certainly if any of the other board members who were there want to do have something they want to share or if any of the board members who were not able to attend have any questions wanted to put that on the agenda so we can uh, discuss it the trustee corporan i have a question yes um my question is hypothetically if this is approved and we receive um the funds um from that bill where would those funds be appropriated to? That would be up to the board. It would be up to the, the board. board. The board could choose to appropriate those in specific ways or wait, wait, to wait. or to not appropriate those, that, those in specific ways. That would be um, like any spending decision, a decision the board would make. So you're saying that it would be up to the board where those funds would go into? Yes. Oh, OK. Trustee Goodfriend? I just think um, um, how should I put this? I, I respect Mr. Tungate. I respect the city. Um, but we have properties that this is a, our family. There are schools in our property. And um, they figure it would be approximately uh, like Pepper School, a million dollars. 
certainly can't get a million dollars out of the other two buildings, although they they tend to think it. So you're talking, let's let's say honestly, three million dollars. What are you gonna do with three million dollars, folks? Nothing. And it's taking away from our neighborhoods and our community the properties for our children and residents. And um, there was a, a uh, plan of action for this community, for the schools. We see our young people in the built in, in the land all around. We put in um, playgrounds. And I think that's terribly important. Three million dollars out of a fifty million dollar budget is a drop in the peanuts hat. Okay. And uh, and whether it was three million or thirty million, I think it's terribly important that we have some um, reservations and thorough discussions before anything is approved for or even putting it towards an action. I I believe that this board has to sit down amongst ourselves. Public or closed, I don't care. It doesn't make any difference. But we really have to get the discussion amongst the seven board members. Amongst the seven board members. Um, I know how Mr. Hoyta feels about one of the other places. I know how I feel about all three of them. So I can't speak for Mr. Hoyta, and I wouldn't attend to. But I will tell you, I just I cannot accept that kind of behavior. And um, so before anything is done, and this was informational, and I appreciate, Mr. Hoyter, you uh, bringing it on the board that we visited it, but it takes a lot more than that to make a decision to sell our precious land. I agree with you, you, Trustee Goodfriend. Trustee, you, I said I agree with you, Trustee Goodfriend. Oh. Trustee oh. Elvin. Yes, uh, first, uh, just like uh, Trustee Goodfriend stated, uh, much appreciation, appreciation to Mr. Tungate and uh, those who are from the city for taking us around and kind of showing us things and, uh, and, and the property and, and what they're proposing. Um, with respect to what Ms. Uh, Trustee Goodfriend said, I agree with a good portion of it. I also have concerns about the valuation uh, that is being presented uh, in terms of what the yield would be in a sale. So, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm open to more discussion, but I did, I also do feel like there, you know, there may be some overestimation of what the yield would be should we sell those parcel, those pieces of the parcel of land in some respect. So. Um, but that said, it was a, a good tour and it was a good opportunity to look at what the land uh, use is and, 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 you know, how it's situated and, and things of that nature. So thank you. Thank you. I agree with you. Okay. So does the board wish to pursue this matter further or um, not at this time? Good. Based on the comments of the board members and that my feelings are in line as well, I'm going to move that we table this issue. I don't know if that's a proper motion, but I, so I don't we, think... we don't need to we don't need to have a motion at this time. It's just if if the board wants to pursue it further, we can schedule further meetings. But if the board is is not um, it, it does not want to pursue this further, then we don't need to pursue further discussion. No. So the, from the looks I'm getting, I'm, I'm interpreting that to mean that there's not a desire for further discussion. Is well, that I think you correct? That one. Right. Okay. Right. Then we move forward with the ATS Educational Services contract. This is our alternative schools and virtual school provider. And um, Dr. Hitchcock, are you going to speak to that? Actually, Ms. Osterlinke is joining us this evening and she will speak to that for us. Yes. Good Osterlinke. evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Hitchcock. Thank you, Board of Education. Um, this evening, we are proposing to renew our contract with the ATS Educational Services for a period of five years. That will be for the 2021, 22 through the 2025-26 school year. 
So a little bit of history about the ATS partnership with Oak Park School. We began this venture in 2011-12 school year. Um, and the purpose of this adventure was to address the educational needs of our students where our student population where traditional K-12 setting did not fit. Um, and we did so by partnering with ATS so that they, we could take a non-traditional uh, approach to academic uh, studies and so that we could graduate students to receive an official diploma from Oak Park Schools rather than uh, perhaps a GED equivalent. Uh, during this 10-year partnership, we have um, enrolled over 6,700 students within this 10-year pa uh, partnership. And on average, since 2015, unfortunately, I didn't have data before then, but as of 2015, Annually, we are able to graduate 145 students with high school diplomas, which I think that's commendable. Um, the contract presented does contain a few changes over the past years of what you have seen. There has been an addition um, for an Appendix B, which is about marketing and research, Appendix C, which is about recruitment and procedures, and Appendix D, which is training and professional development. These appendices only clarify the vendor and district's responsibilities. Well, it is no change. It just clarifies what's been happening. Um, the second thing is the student tuition paid to ATS. Before it was in a two-prong um, segment, we are now using a base of 72% of the student uh, state aid foundation will go to ATS and 23% will go to the district um, based on the 2021-22 budget projection um, that should produce, generate revenue of about $1.2 million. Are there any questions, please? Do any board members have questions about the contract? I didn't hear anything. It was very muffled. I was struggling. Okay. Um, so to reiterate, there's a, there, the contract with ATS, which is our virtual and alternative school vendor, we've been partnered with them since the 2011-2012 school year. There are a couple of additions to the new contract which clarify the responsibilities of the vendor and the, and the district in terms of professional development and recruitment and marketing. Um, the breakdown will be uh, and during, correct me if I'm wrong, was it 7228? Yep. So 72% of each FTE, each full-time enrolled student, full-time equivalent student will go to the vendor and 28% will go to the district. Right. Um, and um, they have graduated since 2015, 145 high school graduates through this program and annually. annually. Thank you, Doreen. And I know, Doreen, you gave us a number for the number of students altogether, I believe it was about 6,000. Did I get that right? 6,700. And sorry, 6, I didn't talk loud enough. Okay, 6,700 students have gone through this program since the 2011-2012 school year. Correct. Any questions from the board on the contract? Okay, so that will be, uh, so I, I do have a question. Do we know what enrollment, um, what the enrollment trends specifically regarding the, the alternative school and the virtual school have looked like these last couple of years? <clears throat> um, we, I, I do have that information. Um, the, the student enrollment over this past year has declined. Um, the projected enrollment is based on approximately 50 students more. Um, if you remember back uh, approximately two years ago, we did lose approximately 600 students in the um, alternative program. That was because the mortar, um, the Lessinger building, if you will, 
was no longer attractive and right. the virtual world started coming, coming into place. So we have maintained approximately 450 students between the two groupings. At one point in time, we reached an all time high of about 1000 students in the programming. But then once that's leveled off, we've maintained about the 450, 490 students in the programming. Okay, thank you. And the 7228 breakdown, is that the same as it was previously? Um, before, it, there was one that was 75-25, and then it was renegotiated to the 72-28. So the, so the district would be getting a larger, per, so the district would be getting a larger percentage under this contract? From, it's the same as from last year, yeah. The same as from the last contract, okay. And of course, as my fellow board members know, we've had a wonderful partnership over the years with Mr. Weaver. That's right and his team and um, the district has one thing, when, the, when we went on that tour of the different buildings after the um, tour was over, since we were at Lessinger anyway, Mr. Um, Burnett gave us a tour of the construction that's going on inside Lessinger to prepare it for the early childhood center and we were able to see that is the building that used to house the alternative school. Now that the alternative school is being moved to fully virtual, that um, that building, and, and there is, I believe also, they're maintaining uh, another location, but, but th there was no more need for that building presence. One of the things that was there though, is the commercial oh, kitchen that they had built for their students and um, they left that equipment for the district, which will now be the Chartwell's catering kitchen for our district. So um, he that was, was very gracious about that. Yes. Um, so with that, we will move to communications and agenda. And once again, are there any communications or addenda from members of the board? Trustee Goodfriend. Yes. Two students from 1980 graduating class um, married, and they both passed away this past week, a day apart from COVID. Andy Lesser and Rebecca Smith Lesser. We lost them both. Bright young people. Thank you, Trustee. Good friend. Um, Sorry about that. Trustee Corcoran. I actually had a question that I did, that I missed to to ask it. Can I ask it now? Or go ahead. But it's um it's for um Madam Superintendent. You had stated about the four um the four. Uh, participants for the games per per uh, athlete, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Um, with our with like the ticket sales going down and certain things that are that are uh, transpiring, and we no longer at this point have a uh, CFFO. Uh, the question I guess I would ask is: Is it possible um, to receive a detailed expenditure report? A detailed expenditure report? Yeah, I guess I guess there is like okay, so I, I was looking at the four. Did I say something wrong? We're getting I guess I was, to make them work hard to Think about it I just muted it. Phone. I'm sorry. I'm not sure where that noise was coming from. Trustee Corporate, go ahead. I guess the reason why I'm asking is because we we used to have like a full, you know, um, a full uh, court of participants. And now that we no longer have, like we don't have the booster program any longer. 
you know, where the athletes can, you know, use funds from that. So with the ticket sales not, you know, making up for that, um, I, I can't see because we no longer receive an expenditure report in our board book anymore. So I don't know, you know, I don't know. I haven't seen it. So I, if I think if I see it, I can kind of answer my own questions if I get a detailed um, are you referring to the check register, which is available on the website? Well, actually, um, that doesn't include the payables, like the everything. Like it, 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 it's only by law you can't put everything um, on there. So what I saw, I didn't see what was on the website. So I don't know what that. I, I'm confused by what, what you're asking for, Trustee Corporate. I just. Okay, so if I could please um, see a detailed uh, accounts payable or the the expenditures that is is done every two weeks. I believe I had this conversation before, and I believe Mr. Barr at the time said that it was um, it was done like every two weeks or once a month. I can't remember when that report is completed. The, the check register, which records every check that was paid out by the district okay. is produced every two weeks and is available on the website. Okay, unfortunately, yeah. what I'm looking for is not there. So everything is not on the website. So I thought this question was to Madam Superintendent, but how, how are you answering? What is it that I, I'm trying to, to to efficiently run this meeting? I'm trying to understand okay. what is it specifically that you're asking for, so and I'm is that something that we a can discuss? Accounting of the expenditures, and, and that is the check register, which is available on the website. So I would like to see it in person, the actual, not the estimate, like the actual of the check. They don't show, it's it's not all there. It's not all there. And I was asking if I can see it as a, uh, yeah, can I? And, and the board the board has okay, several times you. considered that and we're, we're not, but if there's something specific you're looking for that's not there, I'm sure. You can speak I don't with know the because I haven't seen it, so I don't know what I'm going to be looking for. But there are some things that I went on there to look, and I don't see it. So is it is it not that it's not on the website, or is it somewhere else? I, I don't understand. So can I suggest that you speak with the superintendent specifically about those things you were looking for that were not there where you expect them to be, or is this something you know, that? Mr. Hoda. As a board member, it is the board's duty to see the expenditures because we approve budgets. We also have um, over two, what, $20 million um, that was given. Uh, there is no way to track all of that if I'm just looking at the website because there were some things that I was looking for that I did not see. And I don't understand why is it that there's always this question to my question of why I cannot see it. So my question is to Madam Superintendent, may I please be able to see the expenditures, the accounts expenditures. And, and as the chair of the meeting, I'm gonna step in and state that under board policy um, and under the law of the state of Michigan, it is not the board's role to be approving individual expenditures. The board delegates I didn't, that I didn't authority. Say expenditures. I said under the budget. What the, are you budget about? the budget is available both on the website and was provided to all the board members and approved in your board packet. Um, that, okay. That's where the budget is. The check register is available for anyone to see on the website. If I'm trying to understand okay, better what like you're to referring to. I would like to put a motion on the floor. My motion is, is that because we no longer have a CFFO, um, if we could go back to allowing the payables back into uh, the board packet so the board can see what's on the website like have a printout, is that fair? That motion is out of order, considering that the board has already voted on that and our bylaws say we do not 
reconsider motions that have already been voted on until um, a given amount of time has passed or something has changed. We have a CFOO that is going subject to board approval in the, in the next board meeting. Um, so there's really no need for the board to re go through that matter that we've already voted on several times. So that motion is out of order. It is not out of order for me to put the motion chair. Order. The chair determines, the chair makes determinations and under Robert's rules of order, the okay. chair's ruling is final. The chair's ruling is that that motion is out of order as it does not align with our bylaws. Are there any other um, communications or addenda from the Board of Education? Okay, any other communications or addenda from members of the public? You can, you can raise your hand using the participants tab or comment in the chat that you'd like to speak and I'll be and I will call on you. We do ask that you limit your um, your comments to three minutes so that all who wish to speak may have the opportunity to do so. Yes, please. <laughs> Okay. And can the chair recognize? Me, can the chair recognize me, please, William Boyer? Jeez. Okay, Mr. Boyer, go ahead. Thank you. It's it's, it's been a while since I've spoken as well. Uh, it's my twenty third year at uh, Oak Park High School in the district, and uh, it's been really exciting to see everybody in person today. But I do just want to echo my uh, colleague, Ms. Haichu, that. Uh, Many of us um, took a 5% pay cut or we're still in the district. We had a pay freeze from 2010 to 2015 after a 5% pay decrease. Um, with the $20 million fund equity, the increase in state per pupil allowance and COVID relief funding, we just think it's ill-timed and unwarranted to uh, be the only district we're aware of in the county to be on a pay freeze for teachers. So uh, hopefully with the wage reopener, we can uh, soon um, see that the teachers will get what they deserve. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And are there any communications or addenda from members of the administration? No, thank you. All right, then I will, if there's no objection, 